1920s, a momentous event occurred. British Railways would herald in a golden age, an age when engineers could design locomotives that would push power and speed to the limit. That momentous event was the amalgamation of the 123 companies that made up Britain's railways. Dubbed the Big Four, each new company would run a quarter of the network. GWR, Great Western Railway, Brunel's Magnificent Railway to the South West, LNER, London North Eastern Railway, the whole of the East Coast to the tip of Scotland, the LMS, London, Midland and Scottish. The industrial heartland of England to the west coast of Scotland. And the Southern Railway, serving the suburbs and seaside of the south coast. Now that the 123 companies were down to four, they didn't have to compete for passengers. They could now concentrate on being the best. It was time to produce some exciting new locos. No wonder people became train spotters and bought cigarette cards. Look at this. In the 20s and 30s, most people travelled by rail, not by car. You could buy a ticket at a mainline station and get on a train pulled by a locomotive like this. It was the fastest you could go unless you were in a Bentley going round Brooklands. Ha <laughs> ha! Locomotive engineers were proud men from a proud tradition and they wanted to work for the best. By the time of the grouping in 1922, when the big four companies were formed to rationalise the railway system, the GWR was the best. Their locos were the yardstick that all others were judged by. With designs way ahead of the competition, the GWR became affectionately known as God's Wonderful Railway. And this is one of those fine designs. Earl Bathurst. Built in 1923, one year after the grouping. All locomotives have evolved through generations of in-service experience, and that was particularly the case with the GWR, with an unbroken lineage of engineering excellence from Eisenbach King de Brunel through Daniel Gooch to Church Ward and Collett who designed that loco. It's a castle class, spoken of by enthusiasts in hushed tones as being in the best church ward tradition. George Churchward was a perfectionist an engineer with an incredible eye for detail. And in this age of great rivalry, attention to detail was what kept you ahead of the competition. Churchward was an engineer who learnt from practices in other countries and from the French. He learnt to use steam at 225 pounds per square inch, 25 pounds more than was current practice. He also learnt to use four cylinders driving each of the first two axles, giving a much smoother and balanced ride. At the vast GWR loco works in Swindon, Church Ward's policy of constant steam improvement meant that his men had to undertake new and demanding challenges. Church Ward's personality, the way he dealt with his men, and his constant hands-on approach meant that he could institute real improvements. Take his ideas on tapered boilers, for instance. In case you were wondering, normal boilers are parallel. But this has a flared end. There is more area available for heating at the firebox end. Plus, because of that flare, you have a natural point, a high point, so you can collect your steam. Also, it's cooler at the thinner end, so you have a natural tendency of the water to circulate. 
Once again, creating more efficiency. It's very clever. Steaming becomes more efficient. Small gains found over years of trial and error improve the breed. Churchwood died at the age of 76. Retired, yet still fired with a passion for railways, he stepped onto the track to examine a loose rail and was hit by the Paddington to Fishguard Express. Ironically, it was being pulled by the Barclay Castle, a development of one of his own designs. His successor was one Charles Collett. Collett's big contribution to the GWR was to complete the standardisation programme begun under Churchwood. By the 20th century, the locomotive works had started using electrically powered drilling machines and presses. Collett could see that if the engines were built with precision, they could be serviced with standard parts straight off the shelf. The result would be more efficiency, reliability and economy. Science was the answer to standardisation, but the problems are huge. It's symmetrical, a locomotive. You've got two sets of everything. And along this huge length, with one, two, three, four, five axles, the possibilities for deviation are huge. Everything has to be measured up. Everything has to be aligned. It's no good doing it with string and eyes. The GWR turned to Zeiss and bought in optical measuring equipment to get everything correct. Collett had scored another resounding success for the GWR. Now their engines were even more efficient. With their incredible speed and punctuality, they were leaving the other three companies standing. The GWR's engineering excellence gave it locos that could pull its named trains, like the Cheltenham Flyer. In 1929, the fastest scheduled steam service in the world, averaging speeds of 75 miles per hour between Cheltenham and Paddington. And they did so with remarkable economy, producing 9.9 .9 pounds of steam for every pound of coal. And that was a statistic that was never equaled by any of the other big four companies. It wasn't just the engineering that mattered. British designers always made a great effort with the appearance of their locos. You don't have to be a locomotive connoisseur to appreciate a castle class. They are beautifully proportioned. It's got lots of Victorian touches still. The brass safety valve bonnet. These brass lined wheel plashers. But underneath all that is the most modern locomotive of the big four companies. The castles set standards that other engineers tried to match. They were much admired for their efficiency, but more importantly for their speed, because speed captures the public imagination. Speed sells tickets. The LMS, the LNER and the Southern Railway were just no match for the mighty GWR. The Times summed up the situation in December 1929. It is not easy to find a reason, other than inertia, for the failure of most of our railways to improve the speed of passenger trains in the last quarter of a century. What the Great Western can do many times a day, all through the year, should be possible on some of the other lines. The focus had shifted. The competition was no longer all about reliability and punctuality. It was now about speed. An epic battle was about to be fought the fight to run Britain's fastest passenger train.
By the early 1930s, engineers were designing trains that could go further and faster. Long distance may have come first, but it was speed that the public loved. And the Great Western was no longer stealing the show. In 1935, the London North Eastern Railway grabbed the limelight with a stunning new design. This streamlined masterpiece is an A4 Pacific and it looks fast even when it's standing still. It was designed by Nigel Gregsley, the chief mechanical engineer of the LNER. These were the flagships of the LNER's express services north from King's Cross to Edinburgh. Gresley proudly proclaimed that his streamlined Pacific class was now the most powerful engine in the world. The GWR begged to differ. The castle class was unrivaled for speed and power, they said. It was time for a showdown. Over luncheon, with the LNER Sir Ralph Wedgwood, the GWR's general manager, Sir Felix Pohl, suggested a friendly interchange between the two companies to find out whose locomotives were the most powerful. In 1925, the GWR's Pendennis Castle pulled an express from London to Doncaster, and the LNER's loco, unnamed, number 4474, pulled the Cornish Riviera from Paddington to Plymouth. In other words, they'd swapped engines. For a whole week, they tried out each other's locos on their own routes. And the winner was the Great Western Railway's Castle Class. But this came as no surprise to Gresley. His specifics were not running well. But the trial gave him a chance to discover the secrets of the castles. How, with their smaller fireboxes and boilers, did they manage to steam so efficiently? He discovered that the secret of the castle's extra power lay in the superior design of the valve gear and its highly efficient steam circuit. Gresley copied the idea straight into his own locomotives. The result was spectacular. At last, the LNER Pacifics had reached their full potential. This is the counterpoint of so-called competition between railways, the free flow of information through engineers who also interchange between employers. Gresley used the information well, increasing steam pressure from 180 pounds per square inch to 220 pounds per square inch. By 1928, LNER trains were a match for the GWR. Famous services like the Flying Scotsman, which left King's Cross every morning at 10 a.m., created a sensation by doing the 400-mile trip north without stopping to change water, cruise or pick up coal. The cavernous firebox of the Flying Scotsman would consume a massive 10 tonnes of coal on the non-stop run to Edinburgh. Single firemen couldn't be expected to keep up with such a task. So, Gresley came up with a way of changing crews without stopping the train. The corridor tender. They could walk through here from the first carriage. Gresley worked out how little room he needed by shoving his dining room chairs together and walking between them. Simple idea. Amazing no one had thought of it before. Passengers were now enjoying the longest non-stop journey in the world. But for Gresley and the LNER, further glory lay in shaving yet more valuable minutes off the timetable. Streamlining. Even though the inner streamlining of the steam circuits was more important than any flamboyant outer casing, this was the age of streamlining. And it was this design concept, as well as the speed of the A4 Pacifics, that gave Gresley a household name in the 1930s. On its first public run in 1935, the Silver Jubilee, an A4 Pacific like this, hit the headlines with a world speed record 
of 112 miles per hour. And as if that wasn't enough, Gresley, being an ex-carriage designer, provided services like cocktail bars, buffet cars, a barbers, even a cinema. You can see what a vision he had for the railways by looking at these unique teak coaches that he designed. By the mid-1930s, the LNER had become synonymous with speed and glamour, especially amongst the grouse shooting classes on the long route to Scotland. But soon, a sleeping monolith that also offered services from London to Scotland was to wake up and challenge the LNER's dominance. In the early 1930s, the LMS was Britain's biggest single employer, but like many big corporations, it had become hideband and inefficient. Things had improved since the late 1920s, but it was still running a ramshackle array of different locomotives. It was a shambles, and it was notorious for its punctuality. Again, the Great Western provided the solution. Former GWR man William Stanier became the new chief mechanical engineer of the LMS in 1932. Brimming with ideas and enthusiasm, his task was to modernise the fleet and restore the lacklustre reputation of the LMS. The LMS had the more difficult route to Scotland. So to compete with the LNER, Stania produced this, the most powerful class of locomotives ever built in Britain, the Princess Coronations. This is the Duchess of Sutherland, Your Grace, number 6233. Built in 1939, the heart of this beautiful machine was its magnificent boiler, producing steam at 250 pounds, transferred to the driving wheels through four cylinders, an idea Stania took from the GWR. Two inner and two outer. The inner cylinders drive the front wheels. The outer cylinders drive the middle wheels. Smoothness and power. The driving wheels themselves are six foot nine inches in diameter and over her working life carried her 1,650,000 miles. And this is the beginning of the cavernous firebox, said to take a fireman to the limits of human endurance. With the size and power of the duchesses, the LMS could now challenge the LNER. Gresley's streamlined Pacifics thundering north with their 600-tonne non-stop trains. But there was something else needed, especially in the fierce competition of the 30s. And in the coronation year of 1937, it needed more, more publicity. Something to really set the public alight. So what revolutionary idea did they come up with? Streamlining, again. Stania hated the streamlining. Engineers like to see the functional beauty of their machinery exposed, and besides, it interfered with maintenance. There was no practical advantage to streamlining, and most claddings were removed within two years, never to be seen again. Stania's Princess Coronations had their greatest moment of glory in 1937, when they beat the LNER speed record by one and a half miles an hour. Less than a year later, the LNER snatched back the title with an A4 Pacific called Mallard. Mallard broke the world record at a speed of 126 miles per hour. They almost broke the engine too in the process. Pushed to its limits, it needed major repairs afterwards. The passengers must have been a bit bewildered to be hurtling through the countryside at that speed. But no steam locomotive has ever beaten it. Now the Southern Railway would play their cards. In 1938, the engineer OVS Bullied transferred from the LNER to Southern. He was a radical innovator. His locos featured air-smoothed casings, 
another version of streamlining. Nicknamed spam cans after the square tins that spam comes in, the casings hit a multitude of novel features. Low maintenance valve gear, a welded boiler that could handle 280 pounds per square inch, a steel rather than copper firebox. It also sported lightweight wheels, racing green coachwork and go faster stripes. And just to be different, a continental system of numbering. These eye-catching locos ran prestigious services such as the Atlantic Coast Express and the Gold Narrow boat trains. But it was all too late. There was no longer a desire for such eccentricities. Many of Bullied's ideas proved unreliable in service and almost all of his engines were rebuilt when the railways were nationalised in 1948. The age of the unique loco was over. Everything was now under the control of British Rail. In the years since the golden age of steam, we may have built faster locos and we may have made them more efficient, but they've never been as beautiful. Nothing beats the sight of an LMS Princess Coronation class in steam. The ultimate in speed and power. 161 tonnes, 3,350 horsepower. O.S. Nock, the famous railway writer, said, there are not enough superlatives in the English language to describe a princess coronation in full cry. We shall never see their like again. Richard, are locos male or female? Definitely female. So Earl Bathurst is a bird. <laughs>